In this video, we are going to take a look at Riemann sums and definite integrals. And we're just, it's going to be kind of a less interactive video than what I typically do, but it's an important um, step in understanding the connection between what we were just doing in our last video and what we will be doing with the fundamental theorem of calculus in the next section. So this is sort of the go between. So this is Riemann sums and definite integrals defined. So in our last video, again, we were looking at partitioning the interval into n equal subintervals. So each subinterval had the same width, delta x, which was b minus a over n. But what if we had intervals that were not the same width? So what if our intervals were defined by i squared over n squared, which means that we're going to have intervals that as n is increasing, the fraction itself is decreasing because we are um, dividing by a larger number. So the value is going to, or the width of the interval is going to be getting smaller. Now, if we subtract the left and right endpoints, so this is the same thing we did before, we never had to do it this way, but we said the two endpoints were a plus i minus 1 delta x and a plus i delta x. So if I'm subtracting those where a is obviously 0 and this is i minus 1 delta x, um, so we're basically using i squared over n squared and i squared over n squared. We're getting delta x to be 2i minus 1 over n squared. So this is the left and the right endpoints, which again, those endpoints, that interval is going to be getting smaller. But what we're going to do is we're going to do the same process we did before. We're going to find the limit as n approaches infinity of the summation as i goes from 1 to n of the function value, which is the square root of x. So we're going to use the square root of um, our x value, x or i squared over n squared, and then our delta x, which is 2i minus 1 over n squared. So I'm not going to go through that math step by step because we did that in our last video um, a lot. But just as we did before, we're continuing. Um, we're replacing, for instance, i squared with this function. We're replacing i with this function and doing all of the algebra to reduce. Now, as you can see, even though those intervals were not the same, we were in, we did end up being able to solve it in the same way. So we got the limit as n approaches infinity of 2 thirds plus 1 over 2n minus 1 over 6n squared, which left us with a limit of 2 thirds, which is equal to the area. So even though our example had subintervals of unequal widths, we're still able to compute the area. And the key reason for that is that as n increases, so as n approaches infinity, the width of the largest subinterval called the norm, which is here, the norm approaches zero. So as the, I'm sorry, zero, not infinity. So as n is increasing, the width of the subinterval is approaching zero. So essentially we're saying those intervals are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, like in our last example. And as long as that is the case, it doesn't matter if delta x is determined by equal subintervals of b minus a over n, or intervals where as n increases, the norm is decreasing, Either way, we're going to be able to use what is called the Riemann sum. So let's define a Riemann sum, which will take us into definite integrals. So we're saying f is defined on the closed interval a, b, and delta is a partition of a, b. So essentially we're saying we have a partition. It might be those equal length intervals, equal width intervals, or they might be different intervals as long as the width is decreasing. Um, if you have ci as any point in that interval, you can find the sum as i goes from 1 to n of f of c of i, which is in that subinterval, times delta xi. So it's a little bit confusing to try to wrap your head around, but essentially what it's saying is 
As long as these conditions are met, you can find the area in the exact same way that we found the area when the intervals were equal intervals. So now let's just get to the good stuff. We know that this defines our Riemann sum. And if that function is defined on the closed interval AB and the limit of the Riemann sums is given by that function that I just circled, then F is said to be integrable on AB and the limit, this limit that is the same as the limit up here is described by the definite integral from A to B of F of X DX. Okay, so let's try to make sure we understand the importance of this. We're saying that if we can find the integral from A to B, so this is a definite integral from A to B, that that is going to be the same as the area under the curve from A to B of our function. So why am I so excited about that? Why am I even talking about this? Well, because if we can learn how to integrate, and we've already started to learn how to do that, and then in our next section, we learn the fundamental theorem of calculus, which will be amazing, then we're not gonna have to do that crazy long process where we have to find the left endpoint or right endpoint and take a times delta x and do all of that. So I'm revisiting an earlier example. In our last videos, we took a look at finding the area of the plane region bound by f of x is equal to x cubed on the interval from zero to one. So really what I did is I just recopied the information from that video onto this slide. And the only thing that I changed is that the area can also be written as the definite integral from zero to one from zero to one of x cubed dx. So all of this work for now is the same until we learn some new tricks um, in the next section. But for now, we have all of that works the same. And again, we can say the area is equal to the definite integral from zero to one of x cubed dx and find, because we're finding the limit we found 1 fourth plus 0 plus 0, which is 1 fourth. So for now, you're probably not super excited about a definite integral because really all I did was add that in as, oh, by the way, it's also equal to that. But I promise you in our next section, when we learn about the definite integral and how to do some of those strategies, you're going to be super pumped. Up next, we're going to do a little bit of practice with evaluating a definite integral without using the fundamental theorem of calculus. And we're going to do that so that it's clear that you understand exactly what the integral is and what it is that we're finding before we learn the cool fundamental theorem of calculus.